Hello everybody, my name is Michael Deshpande, and uh, in this course we're going to be talking uh, more about uh, applied deep learning. And so, uh, really, you're probably comfortable with uh, building neural networks and you know training them, but there's actually a lot more uh, going on that you can do to improve the quality of your of your results. People have this misconception uh, about deep learning that oh, all you have to do is just define your network, a couple parameters, and then you know, let it train. There are a lot of different things that you can do to help improve the overall quality um, of your uh, of your artificial intelligence model. And so we're going to be discussing like a ton of different things that you can do to help uh, improve the, the quality of the results of your model. So here are just like a couple of the things that can actually fit on the on the slide uh, here. So you know we'll be discussing things like. Uh, input data normalization and data augmentation so you know you're given like maybe you're given like image data or something and um, you know you want to train a network well there's some things you can do to kind of shift your uh, input data mathematically so that you can kind of it'll help the you know the neural network reach a higher accuracy you know, data set augmentation you know for example we'll discuss is you know what if you don't have a ton of uh, data this is again a little bit more towards image processing but if you don't have um, you know, a lot of images, how can you kind of artificially or synthetically generate more given the ones that you see? And then we'll be discussing things like overfitting and regularization. Um, overfitting is probably one of the huge, uh, overfitting is a massive problem, especially with these, these deeper models that we're going to be uh, getting into. So this is quite an issue, but fortunately there have been, you know, techniques that have been invented over the past years that help kind of combat uh, overfitting. And so we'll, we'll be discussing some of these, like right, regularization, um, early stopping, and whatnot. You know, cross-validation um, is, we, we kind of discussed a little bit, like there are a lot of different hyperparameters to a, to a neural network, like things like learning rate or um, regularization strength or something like that. So the, the question is then, how do you select values for these? And so you can use use a, a very um, thorough technique called cross-validation and that will kind of help you select uh, the parameters that you want. And we'll be discussing some parameter update algorithms, so gradient, uh, gradient descent, uh, mini-match gradient descent is definitely the most popular, or the, or the um, I don't, don't want to say most popular, but it's probably the easiest to, to start off with. Um, but there have been lots of different um, uh, learning algorithms um, parameter update equations that you would call it. we're not going to look too much into the equations. I'm just going to give you like a very a very high level overview of what's of what's actually going on there. But we'll be discussing those um, in in particular. So things like how can we augment? How can we solve some of the issues that we're that we might run into with gradient descent, like um, rapid oscillations and weight? And so we'll discuss things like momentum updates, and um, we'll also discuss. Um, kind of briefly, the probably the most popular kind of update algorithm called ADAM, which is just stands for adaptive moment. So we'll be discussing all this stuff uh, as well. And so we'll talk about weight initialization, batch normalization, and then this really neat thing um, that was actually published maybe a couple years ago uh, called the spatial uh, pyramid pooling. And uh, so this kind of solves one of the big issues with convolutional networks in, in particular is that all the inputs to a convolutional network have to be the same size. So, like, how do you how do you get get around that? Basically, if you have images of varying sizes, how do you uh, get around that? And so, we we'll be, we'll be discussing a little bit about that uh, as well. And then all the stuff that we're going to be discussing, there's going to be like little snippets of Keras code so that you can just kind of copy that down and uh, use it. So anyway, that's just like the topics that we're going to be uh, discussing here. And so, we we'll, might as well get started with the input data. So, in particular, uh, let's take a second to talk about uh, data set augmentation. So with data set augmentation, kind of the, the point of this is if you have a very large neural network, you need to give it lots of training data because, you know, the, we'll, we'll discuss a little bit later um, like the different kind of issues that we can run into, but overall, the more parameters uh, that you have, the more data you need to help figure out what those parameter values should be. And you know, some issues you might run into especially if you're kind of working on your own problem, is that you might not have a ton of uh, training data to begin with. And so, you know, this might, you might run into some uh, issues where you don't have a lot of data, but you have a lot of parameters. So the parameters don't know what values to, uh, uh, 
uh, to go to. And we're actually going to talk kind of later about uh, this thing called transfer learning that might also help uh, in this case. But data set augmentation is also something that's pretty common that you can use to help uh, basically create like synthetic data from your existing training set. This is you know, more some of the operations that I've listed here, by the way, are, are mostly applicable to uh, image data. So if you have a lot of, um, you know, if a small amount of image data because you're working on kind of like a specialized problem, uh, you want to get the most out of the training data that you have. So, you know, it, one, one easy solution is you don't have a lot of data is, oh, just go collect more. But collecting this data, depending on what your domain problem that you're working on, this actually might be incredibly expensive um, of an operation to do. Um, either in, in terms of time or money or, you know, whatever. Collecting just training data can, can be quite expensive. So the idea is that instead of, you know, um, instead of dealing with this uh, in, in a collection way, maybe try to take our existing data set and make little changes to it so that we're doing things like a classification task, we can kind of help uh, improve uh, robustness actually as a, as a side product, but also we can increase the size uh, of our of our training set as well. So it's kind of like the other benefit uh, to this is that we can also make our our, our uh, model or classifier, for example, be more robust. And so how how we do this is we just perform a series of operations on a on our training set. So suppose I have one image of a cat in in our training set. Well, if I take that image and I rotate it by three degrees counterclockwise, it is still an image of a cat, right? So, and uh, because of the way that uh, the convolutional networks are set up, those two are completely different images. If you take one image and you, you know, rotate it just by three degrees, that produces a completely new image from the perspective of the convolutional network. So voila, you've just created a new image by doing a very simple, uh, simple operation. And so there are other operations that we can do uh, as well. And so rotations is a very common one. You know, you just have like a range. You say, oh, I want to rotate, I mean, all my images like by at most plus or minus 20 degrees. So that's a very common one uh, to do. Another common one is also this like scale cropping. So basically you can take like random crops of your uh, images. You can do all different kinds of scaling. The only, down, the only thing about this is for convolutional networks, you have to make sure that the, when you crop, like the input sizes into the network are all consistent. And we'll talk a little bit about later with this um, spatial pyramid pooling stuff on how maybe you can get around that. But for now, let's just say that when you do these crops, you have to make sure that you, uh, the, the size of the crop is consistent with the, with what the input of the, of the convolutional network is expecting. So that's also a, a very popular thing. Uh, to do and another thing is like flipping or reflection so you can take an image and just kind of like flip it horizontally or vertically for example so I take a picture of a cat and I flip it horizontally again it's still a picture of a cat and then another thing uh, you might see although this is maybe a little less common is to actually introduce noise into your uh, training set that way again you kind of you can make your classifier a, a bit more robust um, but usually there's like pre-processing steps to this image that, that you would apply that might help improve, uh, to, it might help uh, get rid of noise, for example. So anyway, that's just some of the, uh, the, the data set augmentation stuff that you can do. And we're we're going to see Keras code on how to do this, actually. Keras makes it super simple uh, to do. You just give it in your train, you give it your training data, define what kind of operations you want to use, and then you can just, you know, it, it'll work. So that's kind of data set augmentation. But what about the images uh, themselves? So uh, what we usually do, particularly with, with image data, is we want to do some kind of cleaning with this. And uh, one very, one thing that's used you know, almost universally is you zero, you shift all your data so that it has a zero mean and a unit variance. It's called normalization. And so this is, again, a very common thing to do. And this turns out that this actually works uh, really well. Now they're like, some mathematical uh, properties, nice, there's some mathematically nice things that happen when you do this, um, but we're not going to get too much, uh, I don't want to get too much into those, but this is a really cheap operation to do, and uh, de well, depending on your uh, data set and, and image sizes, but it's a fairly, you know, simple operation to do, and it ends up 
your network ends up producing better results overall. So this is just something that you know people have done. In the past, like when we've discussed coding stuff, I've tried to do this uh, as well. And so, or at least with the you know with zero mean stuff, that's actually a very very common thing to do. Another thing is called principal components analysis, and basically what this does, it, it, it you can just reduce the dimensionality of our input. And this is very popular actually for unsupervised data. So you might have uh, you know unsupervised uh, data maybe, or and it doesn't even have to be images, right? You can just have unsupervised data and principal components analysis is kind of like a pre-processing step where if you have a thousand dimension, you know, a thousand dimensional thing, maybe it's an image or something, you know, then what you can do is reduce that to maybe something more feasible like uh, 128 dimensions or something, which is a, a quite a leap, you know, in, in order of magnitude from a thousand uh, dimensions. And the way the PCA is going to do this is, I don't want to get too much into PCA specifically, but the way that, you know, the way the PCA works is it's going to select the uh, most influential uh, 128 uh, dimensions. And so you kind of get that little, um, that, that little bonus. Uh, there, so this is super popular for unsupervised data. And again, there's really simple ways to to do this. Kira says something, so I could learn. You know, so performing these kinds of pre-processing operations are are going to work uh, fairly painlessly with pretty much any library you decide to use. And one other note, one other note that I'll mention is this thing called uh, whitening or sphering, and this basically just does this thing where it decorrelates your data and produces a, a unit variance. And generally, you run this after you run principal components uh, analysis. And again, this is just one of those things where if you do this, your, your network tends to produce a better result and it's kind of a cheap operation to uh, do. I, there's like a ton of mathematical backing. There's, well, I want to say a ton of mathematical backing, but there is some uh, backing to this, uh, but it, it's a little bit too technical. I just, so I don't want to get quite, uh, quite into that. So uh, anyway, this is, that's a lot of talk about this stuff. So how do we actually use this uh, in Keras? So again, this is pretty simple to do. So these first three lines of code, I'm just loading in my loading in my training data. In this case, I'm using uh, the C410 uh, data set. So I'm just loading in my training and my uh, testing data. And then what I can do is create this thing called an image data generator. And then I can define all sorts of different uh, features about this. So for example, the first two, a thing feature wise center and feature wise standard deviation normalization that's what produces the whole uh, zero mean and unit variance and so again that's just two lines of code and done you're you're done from there uh, another thing is or the line under that rotation range is again what i discussed it's the the, the degrees uh, on how much you want to rotate um, your image and this will deal with all the sizing stuff for you so you don't have to worry about uh, you don't have to worry about that the width and height uh, shift range basically is just what uh, percentage of the image do you want to do like horizontal or uh, vertical shift. So in this case, I just said 20%. Uh, and then, you know, there's flipping, there's horizontal and vertical flipping that you can do. And then there's that ZCA weighting. So ZCA and PCA are related. I don't want to get too much into ZCA, but it's, it, this is effectively just the, the, um, the, the whitening step or the sphering step that I discussed. So anyway, once you define this image data generator, all you have to do is call fit on your training data, and it, it will, you know, it works with a another function called fit generator, and um, you can, you know, again, you can keep basically just keep generating data uh, from this, this using that um, uh, flow function on the on the data generator. So right here, you know, you can see a data gen uh, dot flow, and you give it the the, the input x and the input uh, y. And then you give it a batch size, and then from there you can basically just keep uh, keep going. And so there are another parameter you have to define. You have to define steps per uh, epoch, and that's really just you know, whatever your batch size is, or however whatever your training set is divided by your batch size. That kind of helps. That way you're not you know infinitely training uh, your model, if generating an in infinite amount of data, training your model uh, like that. You have to have some kind of uh, stopping point. But anyway, using just these lines of code you can help improve the, the, you can improve, you can drastically improve the size of your training set. Now, we're going to be discussing some other stuff later, and that's kind of, it's kind of going to be, you know, discussing uh, how do you know when to stop uh, training and whatnot. So we're going to be discussing a little bit about that later. 
but I just want to take a quick second to recap. Uh, so uh, we were mostly discussing uh, how we can augment uh, our existing training set because we might not have a lot of data that we're working with because we're working in a specific domain, but we have a very large network that we want to train. And so one solution to this is you just take your existing data set and apply different operations to this because from the perspective of, of the computer, from the, the neural network, taking an image and doing a little operation to it is going to be completely different. There's results in a completely different image. If I take, you know, like I said, an image of a cat and I rotate it by three degrees, is a complete, you know, the pixels are all completely different now. So they're just like little cheap uh, operations that you can do with this. And then I talked a little bit about some pre-processing and cleaning stuff that you can do with your data, like zero mean unit variance uh, works really well. If you have very high dimensional data and you're working on a model that isn't terribly meant for high dimensional data, you might want to do something like principal components analysis, which will help improve the training time and, um, and quality as well. And there's like this quick thing that I mentioned called whitening or sphering that basically just decorrelates and produces a unit variance. Again, don't want to talk too much about um, covariance matrices. And in Keras, it's really simple to do. You just create this image data generator, say what the different parameters, the different kinds of augmentation stuff that you want to do, you fit it, and then you can call flow, and that'll just kind of keep generating uh, batches of synthetic uh, image data. And so that's super useful uh, to do. So anyway, we, we just discussed all the stuff about um, data, data pre-processing and, and data, data set augmentation. And uh, then the next video, we'll be discussing a little bit about how you can actually, how do you know when to uh, stop? Because with flow, you can keep going for uh, quite a long time. But we'll be discussing um, you know, some other stuff about how you actually can, you should like, be monitoring your training uh, set. So we'll be, again, we'll be discussing all this stuff actually in the next video.